Welcome to the OpenSight SiteOps Quick Start course. In this course, we're going to cover how to install OpenSight SiteOps and the basics of using the tools. Once we've covered the basics, we will then actually go in and create a project by acquiring site data, topography, aerial imagery, and then using those tools that you learned in the beginning of the video to create some quick design. All along, we're going to use parametric and optimization to help you do things faster and easier than you would with any other software. Ultimately, we're going to create a 3D model, and from that model, we can get designs, budgets, and ultimately, even visualization. In this course, we're going to go through the basics, and then we're going to go through geolocating a project site, importing existing ground data, grabbing that aerial imagery, creating non-residential project, like a little office building. Then we're going to grade that and look at how grading optimization can do things faster and easier. Next, we'll take the same piece of property and create a single family residential community. Final thing we're going to do is review the deliverables, the budget, the CAD files, the visualizations, and other things that come out of the system. So let's get started learning the power of OpenSight SiteOps. Let's look at how to install OpenSight SiteOps. First, you want to go to connect.bentley.com. Make sure that you're logged in under your username. And from there, go to the grid, the little nine boxes in the upper left corner. Scroll down till you see software download. Click on the tile once you've found the software download. When you do this, it's going to show Bentley products. You will go to the top where it says brand and find open site. Now you will see site ops listed in there, but that is for some older stuff that's out. You don't want to use this. You want to make sure and go to open site. So let's go back up to open site. Click on it and hit apply. Once we hit apply, you'll then see a new tile. Click on that tile. And you'll see the current version of OpenSight Designer, which is where OpenSight SiteOps is delivered as a companion. There are back versions, but don't go more than a couple versions back if you're going to do that, because OpenSight SiteOps has only been in the newest versions. Click Download. Once you click Download, it will start up the EXE that will start the install. Do not go ahead and try to go forward. You want to go to the configure in the upper right hand corner. At this point, you can pick software such as OpenSight SiteOps, Lumen RT. Click what you want to install as companions. Click Next, and just take the other Next as you go along to get back to the original install screen. Click the User Agreement, and click Install. At this point, it will start installing OpenSight Designer, but it will also install, in this case, OpenSight SiteOps and Lumen RT because I clicked to install them both. Once it's through the process, you will have all three softwares installed on your machine. Now that it's finished and you want to find Open Site Site Ops, you'll go to the bottom left hand corner of your screen, click into the search area for Windows. Inside of there, you will type Site Ops, and then you will be able to see Site Ops app. Click on it. Now, you're in OpenSight SiteOps. So let's take a look at the interface. In the upper left, this is where your file management and design tools are located. Down along the middle and to the bottom left is your information center, which will populate as your design starts being created. On the right are your properties, layers, and spatial template control tabs. But in the right corner, this is the important part. This is where we'll have layout, grading, and utility solvers. We'll go into that in a lot more detail as we go through this training. Click on Administration tab, and let's start by creating a project and a revision. Click on New Project. We want to give it a name. In this case, we're just going to call it Training, and it could be Imperial or Metric, and you can change that at any time through the project. Now, let's create a revision inside of this project. This revision is what we would call your drawing file. Give it a name. We'll call this one Base Map, and then just hit the Create or Create and Open to open the new project and revision. Let's take a look at the tools in the upper left hand corner. Let's start by clicking base map. This will allow us to see some of the tools highlighted. Import, import file that you bring in shape files, DWG, DGNs, import imagery, bring in droning information, OBJ files, geolocate this from multiple sources so your projects own the geolocation and that will allow you to grab terrain and you can bring in all types of different imagery. Next is export DWGs, LandXML, Collada, 
your budget, host of different things you can export. Edit. This is going to allow you to manipulate by creating copy and paste and rotate, sign block, a lot of different tools there. Draw. Draw points and paths. Our path is what you'd consider a line and then be able to edit that. This is a layout. This is where your most powerful things are. Boundaries, buildings, parking, parcels. How do you control this information? Grading. Where are you going to deal with borings, constraint areas, borrow, fill, stormwater? View has a couple things you control. How you look at it, 3D models, cost reports, and of course, help. And lastly is help. This is where you can get some information about open site site ops and some links to some other ways of getting help with your support. On the right hand side, we're going to look at some of the pop out tabs. If you don't see them, there's a little button to click out. First one we'll look at is properties. This is where you can look at things such as slopes and controls, and you can do this by the area. You can also do this by the side or point. Layers, this is where you can create layers. Some of these layers are going to be automated, populated based upon the intelligent properties. You're going to be able to see spatial templates, and you're also going to be able to see blocks. Along the bottom middle and left hand side, this is your information area. It's where you can control snaps, you can set the coordinates, but you can also look at the lower left hand corner and get things such as impervious area and parking counts and parcel counts. This is going to help you understand the project as you're going through it. As with most design software, we need to learn some basic drafting. Now, the drafting is very simple inside of SiteOps. You'll learn a lot of it is automated. We also have a help section on the left. You can turn it off, or as you draw something like we're drawing a path at this point, it'll actually walk you through the steps of how to cre create that. Creating a path is just drawing points, and the points will connect as a path. That will be all one continuous path. You can do things such as how do we snap, how do we end a path. Once you've created a path, then you can set things such as what is the path type, what are some properties on this path. Let's just do something as simple as change the radius. I did it to all the points, or you can click each point individually. Next, let's draw another path, and we're just going to crisscross. We'll end that path, and if we come in, and we can now do things such as fill it, trim, offset. So we'll just do a quick little offset. And we're going to offset, you just type in a number in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see that offset, and it'll go to the side that the cursor is setting on. In this case, we're just going to fill it. Next, we're just going to pick on the point and change one individual radius. And you also notice that on a path, not all radiuses are the same. Just like in the real world, in the roadway center line, they're not all the same. So let's draw a circle. Click the center point, give it a radius. Once you give that distance and click enter, you'll see it pop up. You can still go, or we can just pick on that point and have that exact radius. At any time that you want to delete an object, just merely click on it, hit control, and you can select on multiple, and then just hit the delete key. So we'll get rid of the circle. Now let's look at some of the edits that you can do. You can see we can do copy, paste, undo, redo. You can do a lot of manipulation. Let's just come in and copy and paste this. We'll just throw it somewhere down here to the south. So let's get rid of the path we just copied. Click on it. You can hit the delete key or you can hit the delete button. We have undo and redo. Once you pick on an object, you'll notice that certain tools will then highlight. These are the ones that will let you do things based upon the type of object you touched. Move, copy, rotate, flip. A lot of things can be done. Very simple and easy. But you got to be clicked on the object that you want to affect. Now, another way to pick, and maybe I don't want to pick a whole part of an object. I only want to pick a piece of it. It's called chain. So if I want to, want to change this section, I can chain a whole area. I can create a new closed path, or I could just select chain. In this case, we're going to just create a path. And now you're going to, what it's going to do is create a path on top of that other one. At this point, I can do an offset. And if I want to get rid of the original path, I could have just hit delete if I wanted to do that. Or, again, we could leave it to be used later on. So now we have a nice offset that's only a partial part of that path, not the whole thing. Let's clean this completely off. I'll hold the control key, and then I'll pick on these three paths that we created. And I'm just going to hit the delete key. Now, what will happen? I want to show you that, that, that remember that one we chained a piece of? It stayed there. So next, let's look at some other tools, such as I want to geolocate this. A lot of our projects want to geolocate. And we have a service for you. Enter in the area that you want to look at. We're going to play with a site during this training out in Concord, North Carolina. Once we have the property in view, 
I just merely select location and it's going to take this box and it's going to create it based on my view. Now in this case, we didn't have anything to come in yet because we haven't told it to. So we can go to USGS or Esri imagery. In this case, I picked Esri imagery. It comes with the software. And you're going to see that the area may be bigger than the section you brought in. It's not a problem. You can always make the boundary bigger. Just picking on the grips. There's in grips and there's center grips. So in this case, I'm just going to make this a lot bigger than the property we need because I always redefine this boundary later. But you're going to see why I want to make this bigger. Now that it's stretched out bigger than the property, which is roughly the field we're looking at, I want to be able to go in and grab topography. Just want to grab some Esri topo. I just click the button, give it a few seconds, and it's going to create the topo for that area. So now you see why I want a little bit more. I, I wanted to bring in just outside of our property. So within just a few minutes of starting a project, I can have a boundary and some topo and some information put in. And you can see we have, again, layers. I can turn these off. And if I want to change that image and take it down just a little bit, I can just move it and do apply. Sometimes it's a little too bright and to be able to get in and draw. We want to get on a little closer. And as you zoom in, you'll actually notice the quality of your image changes. Let's start looking at some of the basics of the layout tools. Let's start with building. Now, buildings can be imported from CAD files and Collada files and other sources. And you can trace from there, or you can just use those lines and turn them into buildings. In this case, we're going to just draw a simple little L-shaped commercial building. This is out in the commercial district, so it would make absolute sense for this to be built on this type of project. Now, one thing you're going to notice as I'm drawing, there's some little light gray lines that will come out. These will help guide me into ortho style drawing. So if I want it exactly 90 degrees, I can do that. Or I could, at the end, just close path. And I'm going to see a blue building. You now see a blue building. Remember, we're not drawing lines. We're drawing real objects that can have minimal, maximum floor elevations and slopes put on it. The sides of it, no, it's not the middle of the building. How do we interact with parking if we want spaces and sidewalks? Let's add that parking lot. We'll just go up to the tools and we're going to say parking lot. Now we'll get into a lot of these tools in more depth in just a few moments. I'm just going to draw a basic square parking lot. Nothing fancy, right? Just takes a few minutes to draw that box. And a typical CAD software may take 30, 40 minutes to draw the whole thing. In this case, we're going to hit the layout solver. There you go. You're done. This parking lot is fully customizable. This is just your starting point. What if I go along the right hand side and say, I don't want any parking? Click it to take away parking, click to bring it back. What if I don't want parking on one side of the building or maybe I want parking and sidewalk? If you'll notice, if you're on the, if you click something blue and click on that line, which is coming to the parking lot, that will be the building properties. And I want to put a sidewalk. Parking lot automatically adjusts. You'll see the spaces and everything move to take up for that. What if I don't want parking? Again, it's a very simple interface that allows you to go through and look at options very quickly. What if you want to get a little more advanced and you don't want parking spaces north and south, but you want something different, maybe angled? There's a parking direction line. You merely draw that line. So where you want and parking will readjust. I'm going to put a point in this. And let's put a radius to that point and move the point and you will see curved parking. Very simple, very easy to do. Allowing you to have that creativity to satisfy your client's needs. Let's remove that parking direction line, most likely something we wouldn't really do. But next, let's go under layout and let's look at parking points. This allows you to add spaces in an area that may deviate from the standard parking. And you can give a count. This may be an area, for example, for handicap parking. I want so many spaces and I want to be able to give this an actual size. And I may even may want a different material. So we come in and we add this. We can add a couple of different features. You know, we'll take the same depth, but we're going to change the width. And there they are. And as you move that point, and you need to locate them in different areas, you can move it. You can copy and paste it. And it's always looking, how can we optimize our parking count based on the area and the design constraints? What if you want to affect just one row of parking with a parking bay or maybe some directional parking? Click parking bay point, add that in. In this case, we gave it a horizontal difference but if you also noticed it sort of messed up the parking because we didn't have enough room so i just shift the edge of the parking out to take up for that now there's a red and green side you can change things such as depth and slopes based upon that you want to come in and just do some angle parking there you go again simple easy thing to do next 
What if I want to change the aisle width? Well, we can do that as well. Go to aisle point, drop that in where you want. Maybe this is one way aisle, so you're able to reduce the width of it because of that type of design. And we can also do island points. It allows us to customize islands where we need them. Now, in the overall parking area, if I change the parks per island requirement, it will automatically change for me. But maybe on the side of the right, I want to add an island or some islands. I can give it that parks per island, and it will add that in for me automatically. For almost all parking lots, we're going to have to have some drive or some ingress, egress into this parking lot. And this is where we want to use the drive path tool. So we're going to take from the intersection to the northeast, and we're going to run a road down to the parking lot. We're going to do drive path. And we're just going to, for now, roughly eyeball where the edge of pavement is. And we're going to draw a path similar as we did before. And I'm going to right click and I'm going to pick it perpendicular. Or you can pick midpoint in a number of different ways you can bring it in. Automatically, there's your road. You see it ties into the parking lot, creates returns. And if I want to change the radiuses, got to meet fire code. I can come in. In this case, let's go ahead and change the radius to 150 feet, which is minimum for fire code in this area. What if we want to change that tie in? We can do this a couple different ways. If we look at it, you're going to see it's tying into the road. And I pick on that endpoint, it allows me to change the returns. Every roadway tie-in has a little bit of difference that needs to be done based on what's going in and out of the actual project. We can change the stacking. This will allow me to create multiple lanes in or out. So example would be a right and left exit lane. So once we do this, let's give it a width on that right hand side you see green and red just like we did in the parking lot and now it's kicked out for 100 feet at 24 and then i want to come in and put a transition i don't necessarily want all that extra asphalt or that little square look and i can put radiuses i'm going to clean this up and make it look pretty and functional so you can see we quickly created that tie-in point if you want to get more depth in your stacking to add more vehicles just change the stacking depth to 150 it remembers your settings and changes it Next, let's zoom into where the drive path attaches to the parking lot. Now, the big important thing here is there are two points. There's one inside the parking lot itself. Do not pick on that one. It doesn't really do anything. Pick the one where it attaches to the edge of the parking. So if you move that around, you'll see that it interacts with the parking lot. This is also where you're going to change settings, such as making radiuses, entrance, and exit smaller. We've looked at how to manipulate the endpoints of a car path. Let's look at how to select the overall car path itself. There's two ways. One, we can just pick in the middle, select all sides, and we can start playing with the properties that are along that roadway. For example, if I want to put on on-street parking. Now, if I click this, it's going to add it to the whole length. That may not be what I want. Maybe I just want a subset of that. To do this, the easiest way is to use chain sides. I'm just going to pick on chain. I'm going to pick the item or the area, and you can see as I move along, it highlights red, right click, and do select chain. Now I'm only working with a subset of that longer roadway. This may be more what I'm looking for for on street parking. Let's go back and select that overall driveway again, select sides. Now let's look at some of the parameters you can change. You can change your width. You can have curb, no curb. You can have sidewalk. And I can do this independently from each side. They do not have to match. It's whatever best fits. For your scenario. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. And let's go up here and let's look at creating a template. Now you can create templates that can be used over and over again. So let's turn this into an actual template. And we're just going to call it training. At this point we can come in and save this, but you can also see there's parameters we can change as well. This is really important, especially if you're doing subdivision work, where we're going to use the same roadway over and over and over again. Let's draw another car path and let's walk through how to do that. I'm just going to draw one. Maybe we can go to the northwest part of the property. And we're going to tie into an existing roadway. Why well, don't I have to go through setting all those properties again? I can just do select sides. Pick on a template for the cross section. Apply. And it's done. At this point, I just need to worry about some of the returns and radius point. So we'll get rid of that roadway. Again, just a quick show of how to use templates. So car paths can be controlled for grading. You can do that to the whole thing or just a little piece of it. In this case, I want to pick on the drive and I want to select sides 
And if we look in the lower list of those parameters, you're going to see things. What are my K values? Do I have minimal, maximum elevations? Maybe I can control over a floodplain. What are my slopes? So in this case, I want some K values of 20. Do I want a certain cross slope? Do we have to have a cross slope? What is material type? What is the thickness when we grade? In this area, 3.13 is what's required. I change that to 3.13. And then it will apply it to there. Now, same as for parking lot. You can grade a parking lot with controls as well. 1 to 4%. What's the material type? Again, what is the thickness? The thickness will be very important when you're going to grade. We want to take care of that. Dirt is being dug out. And the grade, you just merely hit the grading button. A little window will pop up. We're going to expand this into a larger view. You're going to see that I have my area around. Red is cut, blue is fill. And the severity of that color shows the severity of the cut and fill. And yellow means little to no change. Lower right hand corner, you're going to see the numbers moving because it's grading for you right now. And let's go in and let's turn our boundaries, turn off the triangles, and you can see a little better view of what's going on. We can see the contours. You can see the contours of how it's looking at grading the parking lot, grading the roadway. It's starting to run through those thousands to millions of iterations to help make sure you got the best design that meet the project requirements. We can turn on the proposed contours and see how they look. Now, in this case, they're not set to daylight. They just tie into the existing surface. So you get an overall existing surface with the proposed changes. But what if I want to change that and I want to daylight? There's a section called preferences. So if we go under view, user preferences, this is where you can change all kinds of different things from how do you view it to how the drawing exports, a number of different things that we can do inside of this. So let's go to advanced. Under there, you'll see daylight grading. Change it and then you'll see now the proposed contours are daylighting into the existing. This would be the thing, for example, you want to take to your CAD files and use that as a base of your next level of design. So if you go under cost report, you can actually see some detail to those numbers that were in the lower right hand corner. Get an actual idea of the cut and the feel based on different soil conditions. Your asphalt, your curb, gutter, sidewalk. If you put utilities in, you will see that. If you put customs items in, you will see that. It's a quick little budget to give you an understanding exactly where are the numbers coming from. So I just mentioned a custom item. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say, for example, this project needs a water line that goes from the main road into the building. So I'm going to offset the center line, whatever the requirements might be from the municipality. I'm going to extend that line to tie in. So this can be done to any object, any area, anything you want. You can pick on it and under click miscellaneous cost. Give it some information such as utilities, water main, and I can either do it by foot as an individual item. If it's by foot and I give it a number, when we look at the budget again, we go all the way down to the bottom, you're going to be able to see a water line. And if you change that water line, it will change the number for you, quickly updating your budget. Let's take a look at parceling. So before that, let's erase our slate, get rid of all this. I'm just going to pull back across it. I'm going to go to select and I'm just going to do all objects. It's going to pick everything. I hit the delete button. Now you may see the shadow effect of things. Just hit the layout solver again and it's gone. So let's go talk about parceling. To create parcels, we're going to go to layout. Here you're going to pick on parceling. So we've got to define an area to create parcels. And it's not going to act like the parking lot where I draw it, hit layout, and automatically I see the parcels. We're going to, have to do a little extra work. So first off, let's draw the parcel area. Once I draw the parcel area and we close it, you see a nice little cyan color. Again, nothing drew because at this point we're going to need certain requirements. But first, we need to tell it what type of parcel are we looking for. Similar to the way we had the roadway, you do have the ability to come in and control those parcels and save them as templates as well. So if I want a parcel to be a certain size, a certain depth, we have parcel frontage, we have setbacks, and you can see the little representation in the box above. If you make a change, you can see it. The left-hand side, the easiest way to think about this is layout. The right-hand side, the way to look at that is grading. Again, that will be the difference between the two. And you can pad grade, overlock grading. Again, it depends on what you want to do. So for now, let's just worry about the layout and hit apply. Still, we don't see anything, right? In a subdivision, you got to have ingress and egress. So I'm just going to draw a simple road just through the middle of the project, tie into that other intersection, similar we did for the office building. And now you can see parcels automatically draw. And if I change and pull and rotate and move, 
all that will interact immediately with you. And in the lower left hand side, you'll actually be getting a parcel count. So if we want to come in and change the radius, for example, we always got to meet fire marshal and fire code. Make sure and get trucks through. You can see now I've quickly went in and created that roadway with the proper turn radius. Let's create another path. Similar to what we did before, you can come in and create the path. At that point, you can just say end path and it automatically create lots again. If you want to go to an end point and create a cul-de-sac, just click on it. On the right, hit cul-de-sac. Give it some basic information like radius or offset. And you're going to see there's the cul-de-sac. Things that would normally take you hours to do, we're now doing it in seconds, minutes. Throw a little offset on that bulb. If you want to go clockwise, it's positive. Counterclockwise is negative as you put the number in. It will make that shift for you. So if we go in and do an offset, you can see that it went to one side. Come back and change that to a negative, And it will go to the other side. Let's draw another car path. If we want to come in, let's loop this around. We're going to go to the south side, come up to the other area, and let's attach that part. What if you want to go in and add a knuckle? You can add this in the middle of the roadway. You can add it at the end. A lot of the parts of the country, they like to use knuckles. So we can do that as well. We want to hit a knuckle template. Now, if you're going to notice, you don't really see a visual at this point. We need to pick on what kind of knuckle it is that we want. We're going to pick a knuckle, or is it an eyebrow, which is in the middle of the roadway? So let's go back to knuckle, and you can then have offsets, radius returns, and we'll just add a few things and hit apply. There's the knuckle, and it also pushes the parcels out. Still designing the parcels for you, but it has to go around that knuckle. Let's go into draw, and let's add a point. So if you add a point in the middle from here, this is where I can add an eyebrow. You want to pick the red or the green side. And then you'll see the parcels change to kick out for that eyebrow. To grade this layout, we want to start by picking on the parcel and the parcel template. On the right hand side, as I mentioned before, these control the grading. Whether it's side setbacks, front setbacks, do we have walls? Do we have walls on the house or like a stem wall? Are they on the property line? Giving, giving you your control to help get that grading to the way you want it to be. Then we just hit a grading button. As before, red is cut, blue is fill. Their level of intensity of color is the level that they are being graded. In this case, we're pad grading the actual project. We're looking at every individual lot and grading it that way. Let's go in, turn on the contours so that we can see what was done. There's the existing, and there are the contours tied in. And we have the daylighting feature turned on for the project now. So here's a design that I did, taking a little more time and effort to go in and make it look more exact with a clubhouse and everything that you would typically do in a project. Sidewalks. Now, one thing about a sidewalk, make sure that when you do that roadway template that the sidewalk slope match the center line slope as you would want it. You can see I've created the parcels exactly the way I needed to. One side of the road bigger, the other side of the road smaller. All I did was just use two different parcel areas that roughly meet somewhere in the middle of that roadway. Now I have same project with two different parcel sizes. Now a lot of projects will have amenities. So I just went in and drew a pool. I created the common area, created parking, created the building. Let's grade the project. And you'll see the clubhouse. You'll see a, a darker red and blue because we have maxed out the lots. Tying into the existing areas is a little more difficult. But open site site ops solve the problem for you we have a median we have sidewalk we have exactly what we'd want in a project and it didn't take days or weeks to come up with this it took hours and this is what the power of open site sideups is going to help you do identify issue come up with good solutions and do them very quickly we can even see the pool and in this case i took the time to make sure that i put the depth of the pool because we got to worry about how do we deal with that displaced earth as well With a clean slate, let's go over a couple more tools. We're going to talk about vehicle path and one of my favorite tools, other area. So first, let's start with vehicle path. We're going to go in, zoom into the area that we have used before. And I'm going to go draw a basic car path. Came in, did the connection. All I did was create another area, which we'll talk about in a moment. And I'm connecting to that. So what I want to do now is go into car path. I just want to start creating the center line of a path. 
This is going to help me make sure that the intersection I've created is correct. And if I hit edit, you're going to see Ashto vehicles. I'm going to open this up for you. And for those Ashto vehicles, you want to make sure and click the one you want. In this case, we'll do a WB50. And now you can edit this as well. You can create your own template, similar to the way you've done before. Maybe you need a customized truck for a specific client needs. You can do this. But once you've got the vehicle that you want, you hit apply. And now you can see the tracking for this vehicle. And we can see for sure this intersection does not work. So how do we change it? Let's click on the endpoint. We can start looking at some radiuses. We're going to open these radiuses up. Still not going to work. This is where we can go back and use that stacking and use it to our advantage. Let's open this up to 24. As you're going to see, that's still not quite wide enough to get that truck in. Let's open it up some more. Barely works. Again, part of this is we cannot go across that center line. And I can then just taper down the vehicle. So as you can see at this point, I may have a little bit of room where I can move that vehicle over. Now, the vehicle fits. If you put a vehicle path point, this will put in a representation of the truck, and this will also export in your drawing files when you go to do detail, to do detail construction document. Let's talk about one of my favorite tools in OpenSight Setups, and that is Other Area. This allows me to create custom areas, make them whatever I want, material, slope, doesn't matter. So let's just create any kind of shape. Once I pick on it, you see on the right-hand side, it has the ability to change properties. Maybe something as simple as I want a radius. Picking in the middle allows me to go in and control the whole area. Let's say, for example, we do or don't want no parking. Let's take off parking. So if I draw a parking lot, there will be no spaces. This could be like a landscape area, environmental save area, and you'll see that it interacts. Now in this case, I told just the area. If I told the edge, then the edge would not have a parking lot. If we do this as an existing area, so when we go to grade, it will not grade. So if I have that environmental area we can't do anything to, that will be able to control it. Min max slopes. I want to do a dumpster pad, for example. Just set it to 0 0.01 to 0 0.05. Make it out of a certain level of concrete. Give it a certain depth. I can even change the color of it. Everything inside of OpenSight Sideups has the ability to change colors. And if I grade, Let's open this up, and you'll see the areas that I made it relatively flat. You're going to see it's grading the project, just as expected. Allows you to customize and create areas and objects the way you need them to be to make your design work. So let's clean the slate again. Window, select all. Make sure we hit the layout button so they go away. What if you have typical projects that are just repetitive? I want to do a warehouse in a bunch of different places. I want to do it over and over and over again. Well, you can do this by using template. So if we go into the spatial template, this is nothing more than a collection of parking lots and buildings and other areas and objects. Here's a cross dock facility. I use this many times in my career. So I made one and saved it. I can rotate this into place. I can move it around, and this is just a starting point. Doesn't mean this is what I want to finish with, but if I know this is a majority of what I need, we'll do that. Hit the layout button. Now we have parking lots. We have all the grading that I need exactly where I need it. So when I hit that button, it will grade automatically. So what if I want to come in and just make some simple changes or add a few things? This is where we're going to take our experience and create a drive, drive path network, similar to the one I have on the screen. I've made a few changes here and there. This is the experience we bring to the industry. So we now have a layout. And you're going to see certain areas that when I grade, they're going to grade exactly the way I need them to. As you would expect, this is a, a big piece of property with a big building on it. It's going to be pretty intense on the grading. And you're going to look at the grading. For example, you see how it's sloping away from the building. And we'll look at how to control that a little bit better in just a moment. But imagine using a template. I can grade this project within minutes. I can create it within minutes by using those templates. Remember, this template is completely editable by you. Let's look at something you might commonly do, because I know I did, was I had to add 
additional trailer parks. And that's could come during the initial, or maybe they want to plan for something down in the future. So if I pick on that roadway, remember I showed you we could do on street parking. This is a simple way to do it. I want to do on street parking. If we just want one row added, let's come in, do on street parking just in that area, and let's make it the width and depth that I want for an actual trailer parking. Now you're going to see there's little medians. Let's just set that to some really high number in the median between the two go away. So now I can see I've quickly created additional parking. Imagine being able to make your clients happy and do that within seconds. Let's create an other area. I want to make sure that it doesn't grade at two or three to one like the rest of the property right behind that area. I want to come in and maybe create some more area for additional parking later on. I want to use the other area and I'm going to make it flat and I'm going to make it out of a certain material. So when we go to grade this, you will see that now it's taken into consideration and you're going to see that it's moving a lot of dirt. And you see the building bouncing a little bit? That's a good indicator in open site site ops that I have a problem. Buildings aren't supposed to bounce. So when I'm done, you're going to see there in the upper right hand corner, I have a message that says grading is not feasible. If I come down and hit the slope requirements, there's my problem. No matter how much I want, with all the constraints on the site, I cannot go from one side to the other and meet my tie in slope requirements, parking requirements, my flat building. So the question becomes, how do we solve this problem? It's been identified. Software won't solve it for you, but it's up to you to use the tools to quickly solve it. We're going to solve this problem by using a thing called link. So I'm going to turn off those contours and I'm going to use the chain tool again. We're going to chain those two areas and I'm going to do select chain. Over on the properties, you're going to see a thing called link height. That's telling it at zero that it's tying into the ground. If I want a negative four like a truck dock on the building, I would tell it negative four along one edge of the building. But that's not what I want. I just want to get rid of it by unclicking the link height. This tells it if it needs a wall, create a wall. It will only create a wall as big as it needs to des design the project. So let's do grading again. Now you're going to see that magenta color. There's the wall. And you're going to notice it's changing, it's moving. It's looking for how can it solve all the problems on the project and give you the least amount of wall because wall costs more than moving dirt. And you'll see in the lower right hand corner, that's what's happening. The cost is changing. We also notice that the building's not bouncing around a lot. That looks a lot better. And within just a few minutes, I was able to take a major issue that in a normal CAD tool would take a while to solve, we were able to take care of it. And if I go in and turn on that slope problem again, no red, I'm good to go. And this is the value you can open site setups can bring to you. Being able to put in those layouts, do those analysis, understand, is there a problem down the road? If not, if I couldn't have solved this problem, maybe I need to redo my design, which may affect the amount of square footage in the building, which would definitely affect the project and the chance of the project going forward. Let's look at how to do some more detailed grading. So when we're doing those that grading and we go and we look at the slopes in the areas around the, the docks, you see they sort of angle and they got a little low point here in a direction there. That's not what we necessarily would do. So the question is how am I going to use open site site ops to solve that problem? I want it to grade in a certain direction at a certain slope. And the software just has to deal with it. We're going to do this by using what's called a grading constraint area. If we pick on this, this is going to allow me to identify an area that will override the rules of the other areas. So grading constraint area. And I'm going to tell this area, for example, has to be graded a certain way, certain slope away from the building. And it's going to come in yellow. You just go in and say, what is my min and max slope? And we're going to apply and we're going to do a grade. Now I'm going to show you the difference. There's some more tools we're going to add to make it a little more refined. We're going to let it go for just a second, not run through the whole grading process. But if you do notice, a little better, but it's still not what I'm looking for. We've got to solve that problem. I want it to be, again, exactly a certain way. 
This will help control it, but I need to put a direction on this. So if we go back and we highlight that area, we could actually go in and use a direction. Just click on the direction. It will take the area that you have picked and use it. Now, if you had multiple areas, you need to pick the one that you want, apply, want to apply that to. And if we come in now, we're going to see a little bit different design. And when you add these areas, it takes a little bit longer for it to get there. It's starting to push. It's starting to push. And it will get to this. But it still has some flexibility. You're only telling it in one direction. But you're giving it that open area from a half percent to one percent. But what if I wanted exactly one percent? Change the minimum number. And then use construction constraint slope what this is going to tell it no matter what in that direction the slope of that area is going to be one percent so let's grade this again and this is most likely what most of you are going to do i want it to grade a certain way now you're going to notice those contours come straight across now this is relatively flat so you won't really see any contours you'll sort of see them out in that extra trailer area which we assign no requirements to and you're going to see now that it is sloped across Let's change those contour intervals just so we can see a little bit better. There we go. I pulled them down, but now you can see the contours going exactly as they should, pushing that water away from the edge of the building. Let's take the contours back to where they should be. The next thing I'm going to show you is a way to use those spatial templates and grading constraints at the exact same time. Athletic fields is usually the easiest way to show this because you don't have the ability to put a pitcher's mound in a hole. It has to have a mound. It has to grade certain ways. Now, the whole field can move up and down a foot or my, plus and minus. doesn't matter. But the field itself has to grade a certain way. So we have some templates, for example, that show a couple different ball fields. And all these are are a collection of grading constraints attached together with the constraint arrows telling it what it has to do. And you can rotate and change and place these. These are fully usable. So you, when you're using constraints, you're not stuck with just one. You can have as many as you want linked together to create something. So if I come in and ungroup, you'll see now it's just a bunch of areas with directions. That's all it is. And this, I know this is an extreme one, but this is one we show a lot because it gives you an idea. If you want to do a little league baseball field, this is what they expect. Let's do a, a soccer field, for example. It has a lot less areas because there's a lot of consistent slope in certain directions. You want to crown it in the middle, push it out. You have full control of this. So if you want to make a little complex, you can do that. Let's copy and paste that. Imagine we're making an athletic field complex. You can just drop these around in certain areas, have them a certain way. And now I've made a soccer complex to go along with my base, baseball complex. Let's go and grade it. So if you hit the grading button, you're now going to see the red, the yellow, the blue, just to expect. But let's turn on the contours. Now I did in this case have them yellow, uh, orange so that they stand out. If I do, you can see the baseball fields grade differently because remember they had different level of constraints. The soccer fields, since they were all the same, they grade exactly the same. And this is what we want. This allows us to have some consistency in our project. Now, for example, in these soccer fields, you see those areas in between that just don't really look good. So we'll take a, take a quick little hint on how would you solve something like that? Go back to my favorite thing I talked about. Other area is an easy fix. You could use the constraint area. I'm not real worried if it's exactly in one direction or not. I just want to come in, do a other area, go to the properties. And I want to, instead of being 33%, let's make it 5%. Apply it, and let's grade again. Let's go in and let's turn on those boundaries and contours. Now you're seeing it's a lot more realistic because we don't want big mounds between the two fields. If you did, great. If you don't, here's an easy way to identify because there is a cost for flattening that site out. And this is what open site site ups helps you determine. It's not free to move all that extra dirt, but you're now going to have what magnitude of effort it's going to take. Let's go back to the site that I'd done before. I can now look at ponds and stormwater. 
So let's go into stormwater section. You'll see some things like, do I have roof drains? Do I have certain controls? And for the basic training, we're not going to go through some of this. But I'm going to do a simple pond design. We're going to take that lower area. I pick pond area. And you can draw it to any configuration you need. There, again, just like everything else, there is full control. And I'm just going to put a little simple pond. Go to properties. And I'm going to be able to change this. Let's zoom in so we can see a little better. This is where I can give it my riser height. Do I have certain requirements, certain pond size requirements, a berm width. Basic controls. This is not a detailed pond design. It's enough to give you an idea of how much area you need and how much volume of dirt needs to be moved outside of that. So let's grade the pond. Once we grade the pond, we'll turn on some of the boundaries, turn on some of the contours, and we'll take a quick look. Now you can see, for example, there's a wall coming up on the back side of the pond. It has a grading issue. It's not able to get from my tie-in and that steeper area to the edge of the pond that I need to put in. This is where you'd go back, for example. Very easy fix is I'm going to move this pond. I may have to reshape it, move something out of the way, make quick changes. I want to lose volume on that lower end, move it to the upper end, maybe make it a little wider. And let's do a layout again and hit the grading button. No other software does this. This is going to allow you to go in and make those quick designs. So we're not figuring out too much from now we have a wall. We figured out right now we had a wall and we got rid of it. That easy to do a pond. Now we're going to talk about storm drainage. I would only use storm drainage on non-residential projects. The storm drainage is not really set up to go through a subdivision street type network. But if I hit the utility design, it's going to come in and create a stormwater design based upon the grading plan where it stopped just a few moments ago. You can see now that we have multiple inlets and I can control, do I just have one inlet? Where does it go? We don't see any red pipe, which means I don't have a cover issue, which is a really good thing. If I zoom in, you're going to see things like two inlets near each other. You won't see that when we run through optimization. You're just going to see that at the present moment. And you can control your stormwater, your runoff coefficients, your maximum areas into an inlet, all those kind of things we can control with inside the default property area. We're just looking for an idea. Can we get to that pond we just created? If you don't get to it and you got a bunch of red pipes, you got another issue. Pond's in the wrong, wrong location, or maybe we need to raise some items up. Let's go back and look at that budget that we had before, which had no utility cost inside of it except the one that we manually added. So we can still see all the information we want to know about this budget. And if we roll down, you're going to start seeing other things such as utilities. We're going to be able to see flared in sections, pipe runs, manholes, inlets, whatever we needed to create the piping that supports my grading plan. With the design done, now we want to talk about exports. What can we do with this? Under export, there is DWGs, Land XML, 12D, and a host of other things. So let's start with the DWG. First, we need to give it a file location. Where do we want to send it? Save it on the computer where you want to. In this case, I'm just going to put it on my desktop. We're going to give it a name and we're going to save. And you can pick what parts of the SiteOps model you want to bring. So we have SiteOps training. Do we want to bring surfaces, subsurface, subgrade, tins, whatever you might want to bring, you can do that. So we're going to do OK. And it's going to run through the process of packing all that information up and saving it for you locally so that you can use this design in your next steps. And once it's saved, use it in your favorite CAD tool to pick up the design process. You can also save Land XML, 12D, but what if we want to save a Collada file? Collada file is a file that can be shared with LuminRT. We go and we give it a location again. We're going to give it a name and we're going to tell it where we want it to put that Collada file. And a Collada file is a three-dimensional file that can be used in a host of other softwares. So it's just going to give me a little warning. I'm going to say, okay, what version uh, SketchUp is sort of the reference model to a Collada file. We're going to just do that, and now it's saved. We can also submit KMZs that we want to use with Google Earth. So we're going to go in and create this. In a moment, we're going to open these up in these other softwares just so you can see it. But while we're here, let's go ahead and get these files all exported. Where do you want to put it inside the KMZ? With GIF files, we have SiteOps files, which can be shared with any of the Bentley products that import and deal with the DGN. So we want to put that out and save it. It's just an SOZ is the file format so that you know it's a SiteOps file 
that it is coming from. And then, of course, we want to get that cost report. I want to make sure I get a, a CSV style formatted file that I can then use inside of any Excel spreadsheet. A lot of people will put those spreadsheet and then even reference it through sales into a master spreadsheet that adds that to the overall budget of the project. Next, we're going to look at these files inside some of the more natural programs that you would use to complete the document creation. I'm going to Open Site Designer. I want to give it a workspace, a work set. We're going to do a new file. Give it a name. Now we're just going to go up to Site. Under Site, there's the Import SiteOps file. Click on it. You're going to go find the file and give it just a moment to import. Once it's in, you will then need to make sure and do the zoom extents so that the view will fit inside the window. With the file imported, you can now see that I have the design that I created in SiteOps inside of OpenSite Designer. OpenSite Designer is a full-blown CAD tool that's going to allow you to create all your plans, animations, production drawings that you need to take this project to the next level. But the information you brought in is just as active in here as it was inside of SiteOps, even more in some cases. Parcels can now be level instead of multiple parcels at a time. Parking lots can still be edited. There still is a grading button. So all the functionality you had in SiteOps is here inside of Open Site Designer. Let's take a look at Civil 3D. Click on that file and I can just drag and drop that into Civil 3D. Give it just a moment to pop up and then we'll zoom extents to look for that as well. Set my base point. And there we can see the information. In this case, I had GIS parcel. We do have all the contours, all that information. That's not intelligent anymore. Parking lots don't change. Grading plans don't happen. This is just an intelligent model that's made up of all the different information. And they are on layers and the way you would expect them to be. Again, they're just not active anymore. So you, what most people would say is you left the brain behind but you got a really good start to keep going down that next road. Now, let's take a look at the KMZ file. This is one a lot of people like to send to other people that don't have CAD. You can bring the KMZ file, just drop and drag that in again. It's going to zoom right into that area. And I'm going to give you one little hint. As you see, some of the area around the edge is not really showing up that well. You cannot edit the surface inside of Google Earth, but what we can do is take the model and move it up just a little bit so that it floats. To do this, we're gonna come over to the left-hand side and we're gonna pick on this model and we're gonna make the change that will allow us to add elevation to this actual model. Right-click on it, go to Properties. Once inside Properties, there's an altitude. Raise that up just a little bit. You don't need to do a lot, but you can visually see where it will come up. And you want to raise it so that the surface doesn't poke through your project anymore. Then just say, OK. And now you're going to see it's setting right there inside of your project. And if you do have 3D trees on, for example, it may come into your project because the trees rise higher. In that case, I would probably want to turn the trees off and terrain and different things so that it matches in a little better. But if you have it, it's not. Again, it's up to you. For the cost report that we had, we're going to open up an Excel spreadsheet. We're going to drag and drop that in. So when it comes in, it's going to look a little jumbled up. You're going to need to open this up and space it out. That way it starts to look the way you want. Or you can have some preset configurations that you could bring it into, and it will automatically fall into those configurations. This is just a CSV file. Helps you quickly get it in, get that information that you can use however you seem necessary to continue your project. Deliver with OpenSight Designer is LuminRT Designer. It's a free addition that you can use to create those amazing visualizations that we want to use and show clients our design intent. This is a 3D environment. You're not going to create your site and your projects in here. We're going to take them to the next level. One of the things I exported was a Collada file for that project. So if I want to come in and pick on import, I can pick the Collada file. Just say OK. It will take just a second to load, and then I want to place it. And similar to KMZ, I can push and pull and change this so that it marries into the existing area around it. So we're going to pull this up. 
And you can see, for example, in this one, I just brought in a blue building. If I had a real model of building, I could use that as well. I could pick on the pavement. Since it's new, maybe I want a little bit darker. You have control of this model, so I can start doing things to make it look exactly the way I want it to. Now let's change the islands in the parking lot, for example. I only need to pick on one of them because all of them will change. And instead of a color, let's make this a material type. I want to pick on it and I want to make it actual grass. We're talking about blades of grass that move with the wind. It has the shadow effect. So if we zoom in close enough, you're going to be able to see that it's grass. It's just not a color. And on the lower right hand corner, those stars, that is the level of intensity of the 3D interaction. I do work a lot with it on one and then show it on three. Just because the more interaction you have, sort of the slower it can move. Let's change the whole area of the project to grass as well. Let's add some trees. You can add trees in bulk or you can add them one at a time. I'm just going to add some Japanese maples. I can place them where I want to. I can use some of the tools to go back and maybe I want to do them over and over. So if I hit that recirculating button it allows me just to place them wherever i want to there's there's shrubs rocks all the kind of vegetation you would need what if i want to add a bunch of trees almost like a forest i can pick a bunch of trees add them into a group and then once i add that group it'll load in those trees and then i can go over to the left and sort of give a look it has a tree with a circle and a paintbrush and that's what i'm going to do i'm going to paint it so as i move it it will do the trees. And these trees are not the same. They're all randomized. So when, if you zoom in, you're not going to look at the same tree, same height, same branch configuration. They're all going to be different. What if you want to add vehicles? I can go and just do a simple car in a parking lot. All you got to do is put it in and it's going to grab a base color that it wants to start with. But if you put that same car again, it's going to change the color. And on the other hand, I give a lot of people is I only do about five cars in a parking lot. And I just copy them over and over where they change and come up with different color configurations and most people never notice that there's only a few type of cars in the parking lot. When you put them in different orientations and you put them with different colors, people tend not to fixate on the same style. So you can change the color, put it where you want it to, add motion to it, add lights for street lights. And there's just so many things you can do inside Luminar T to take your model from one level to another and do these presentations, it's absolutely amazing. There I added a truck. And if I go up on the left, there's a little box symbol. That's for motion, so I can actually give it a path. It's augmented, so it'll turn with it. If you zoom in, the wheels are actually spinning. Very lifelike. You can give it speed controls. If I just hit play, now again, where I started it, it's gonna come out of the building. Probably would go back and take a little more time and effort to set that up. So one of the hardest things that we have when we create designs is conveying that intent to stakeholders, not just our clients, but stakeholders and our clients' client. Luminar T, by using all this technology, is going to be able to help us do that. So if we look at this model, for example, this is the same building. I've got a real building model that I got off the internet for free. I have the cars. I'm looking at it in 3D. You can create a video or images. To create a video, just hit the video button. Take snapshots along the project where you would like for it to be. It will take those snapshots and generate a movie for you without much effort. And you don't have to be a videographer to do this. So if we just go around the site. Here's one that I've already done. You can see where I just went around the site with different camera views to create a path that I want to walk through this site. Once you do this, you just go in and you're going to tell it to export that. And when you export it, you can do 720, you can do 1080p, depending on the version of Luminar T you have. You can do augmented reality, a lot of different ways that you can export this and it will save on your computer. And once it saves, you can get a nice video similar to this one. This is what a finished video looks like. You saw the sun reflect through the, the pond. You see the cars moving. If I zoom in, you're going to be able to walk down this site, getting people immersed into the environment you just created so they understand exactly what the design intent making it easier for them to understand your design and help get those quicker approvals. And if it's not an approval, giving you feedback so you can make that quick revision. As you know, at the open site site ops, you can quickly do the revision. Take a look at an office building. If we want to look at this office building, this is a micro station building. We zoom in, you can still see traffic. This is out in Colorado. We got a driveway with trees on each side with a sidewalk and 
zoom in, you can see the parking, pe people moving around, people walking, trees that change color and lose leaves based on the season. This is what some of the still images look like. It's a subdivision with a clubhouse and actual buildings on it, a mixed use, multifamily, single family, athletic, industrial, same project from a different angle, helping you convey that design. Thank you for watching and participating in the OpenSight SiteOps Quick Start course. There's a lot more to OpenSight SiteOps than we were able to cover. Try to keep this around an hour. If you want to learn more, you can go to Bentley Learn Server or contact Bentley or Virtuosity to get more training options. Thank you and happy designing.